Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew 17, verses 1 through 9. May we hear the words of the gospel together. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell face down on the ground. Then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus. As they went back down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Would you bow with me in prayer? God, we hear your word. Now, Holy Spirit, we ask for the wisdom to understand it. Amen. Okay, so uh, Kyle and myself are experts, and the office staff will tell you this, we're experts in what are called dad jokes. Each and every week, we have fantastic puns that bring joy and life to the office, and I wanted you to share in that experience just a little bit today. So, because our scripture talked about a mountain, I've got a couple questions about mountain. One, do you know why mountains are always tired? Because they don't ever rest. (laughs) There you go. You got it. Okay. Number two, I always tend to forget how beautiful mountains are. I really tend to take them for granted. (laughs) There you go. Okay. Final one. Final one. How do mountains hear with mountain ears? Yeah. You can laugh with me or at me. I don't care. As long as you laugh, it's a good day. Okay. So enough of that. Um, This thing that just happened that we read in Matthew's gospel It is a figurative and a literal mountaintop experience. Jesus takes the inner circle of disciples, Peter, James, and John, the three he was closest to, up on the mountain, and he is transfigured. His glory appears. And this is a passage that is generally read and preached on Transfiguration Sunday because that's what this event is known as, the Transfiguration. But today, I think it has a lot to say to us, both as individuals, as well as a congregation. So as we look at any part of scripture, it's always important to get a little background so you understand what's going on. So these disciples, they've been following Jesus for a couple years now, and they really have begun to believe that he was the Messiah. I mean, it wasn't that uncommon to leave what you were doing and follow a religious teacher in that day. That wasn't all that weird. At least it wasn't as weird as it seems to us when we read it. So they've been following him. But keep in mind, here's what they thought the Messiah was going to do. He was going to overthrow the occupying Romans. He was going to reestablish David's throne right there in Jerusalem. And you can gather from some of the discussions and arguments the disciples had had, they kind of hoped that Jesus would set up his kingdom and give each one of them a little territory, maybe that they could govern. They kind of had their own ideas too. But as they're going along with Jesus and they have these hopes, Jesus begins saying things that are really disturbing to them, things that really take those hopes and dash them. Jesus starts talking about how he's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be killed and he's going to leave them and go to the father. Now this messes up the disciples plan so much that Peter speaks up And says to Jesus, no, no, Lord, you've got it wrong. That's not how it's going to happen. And before you're too hard on Peter, listen, this guy just has the guts to say what they're all thinking or whispering anyways. So Peter says, no, this isn't going to happen. Remember, Jesus rebukes him with that famous phrase that you might know, get behind me, Satan. But shortly after this, Jesus takes, again, as I mentioned, this inner circle up to the mountain for this incredible experience. 
And up on this mountain, this thing that happens is transformative. While they're up there, the full glory of God is revealed in Jesus, and that is astonishing enough. But who appears with him there but Moses and Elijah? So for these Jewish men who were following their teacher, their Messiah, they now see Moses, the law, they see Elijah, the prophet, and they see Messiah in his glory, the king. Things don't get any bigger for a Jew of that day. This is a monumental experience. Not to mention the fact that they're on a mountain. So remember, mountains. The ark comes to rest on a mountain. Abraham offering Isaac to God on a mountain. The law comes to the people on a mountain. Elijah confronts and defeats the prophets of Baal on a mountain. So the disciples again are thinking, okay, this is it. This is where we're going to set up the home base. This is where we need to stay. This is what God is doing and will continue to do. So Peter again says what they're all thinking. Let me put up three shelters or three monuments here. Let's make this the home base of operations. And God again has to correct Peter. But, but again, Peter gets corrected, but I like the way Peter does it wrong. Better than the other 11 don't do anything at all. So God corrects Peter and says, hey, basically, you guys shut up and listen to him. Stop talking and listen. And Jesus says, get up. Let's go down into the valley. And in the valley was Jerusalem. In the valley was difficulty, arrest, eventually death. You see, we have our ideas we have our hopes, we have our dreams. And God's plans, God's ideas, sometimes they don't go along with what we think. Sometimes things happen differently than we think or hoped they should or would. And that's okay. I want to talk about what our passage that we read has to tell us about mountaintop experiences and tells us why we can't live on the mountain. But in order to do that, I'm going to look at three aspects from Jesus's ministry very briefly. Practices, places, and people. If you go back in the ministry of Jesus, you'll see these things, these three things coming up significantly. First, let's look at practices. So the Pharisees come to Jesus and they question him about the practices his disciples follow, or better yet, don't follow. Mark 2. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, a practice. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. So here's, here's the part you need to catch. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. So the wine here represents two things. One, consistently in the scriptures, wine represents the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. But two, the new wine here also represents what Jesus knows is coming, the cup of the new covenant. And the wineskins and the old garment, they represent the practices, the old ways of doing things. Now listen to me, Jesus doesn't change things just for the sake of changing them. However, Jesus' message is also very clear that God wants to do new things. And sometimes, practices that were good, things that we hold on to, things that we cling to so dearly, even ways that God did good things in the past, can get in the way of the new things that God wants to do in your life and in the life of a church. Sometimes, friends, the old wineskins have to go so we have room for the new wine. Because sometimes our practices 
can take so much of our focus that we forget who the practice is for in the first place. Practices. The second one, let's look at places. John 4, remember Jesus encounters this woman at the well? Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Where's her focus? Where to meet God. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. So catch this, this woman was so worried about where to meet God, she almost missed God right in front of her. You can get so caught up on the place that you miss God and what God is trying to do in your life. So listen, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. It's, it's wonderful to gather here for worship. This is a good thing. But this is not the only place you meet God. In fact, if this is the only place and time you meet God, friends, you need to evaluate your relationship with God. And then I want to say this appropriately. When we're here together, we don't meet God because we come here. We meet God here because we come and God is among us. That is what's important. But you see, places and practices are only as good in God's kingdom as they are at reaching the third part of Jesus' ministry, people. Places and practices are only there for us to reach people. Jesus made people the goal of his ministry. Remember when Jesus healed on the Sabbath and the religious leaders got really upset and Jesus basically asked this rhetorical question. He said, don't you get that humans were not made to fit into the regulations of the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was created to benefit humanity. God does not give us rules just for the sake of having rules. God is not some cosmic scorekeeper. Whatever God gives us is for our benefit. So Jesus never let Places or practices come before people. Quite the contrary, places and practices were only mechanisms for people to encounter God, to love God more deeply, and to love their neighbor as their self. So what does this tell us about the mountaintop experience? What does this tell us about trying to live on the mountain? Three things. First, God gives us mountaintops. God does give us mountaintops. Mountaintops occur for us as individuals and they are energizing, they are motivating, they are refreshing, they are encouraging, and they come at just the right time. The reason, one of the big reasons I'm standing before you today in this pulpit is because I went to a retreat called Curcio and I had this incredible moment of freedom with God. I've talked to so many of you who found your Christian faith energized because of the ministry of a retreat or a mission trip, or a particular ministry. And that's a good thing. And I praise God for that. And as congregations, we have ministries that brought life among us and that have drawn people to Christ and drawn people together here. And those are beautiful things. And as a denomination, we have a rich history. But there's a temptation. And the temptation is to do what Peter did and to say, well, let's just stay here. And if we're not there, it's to say, let's get back to there because this is the only place where God works. And quite possibly, you run the risk of missing where God is leading you next because you're always trying to get back to where God was. God gives us mountaintops and they are wonderful experiences, but the second point, we cannot live on the mountain. 
You ever been on vacation and thought or even said, gosh, if I could just live here, this would be great? You know why you can't? And you know why it's so great? Because it's not reality. Unless you're Richie Rich, you're not living like that each and every day. But reality is where life happens. The mountaintops are great. But you know where ministry happens, my friends? It happens down in the valley. Because we're up on the mountaintop, and yes, we've met God. Yes, the view was spectacular and breathtaking, but we're called to find the lost sheep. And where are the lost sheep? They're down in the valley. Where was Jesus' work to happen? In Jerusalem, down in the valley. We cannot live on the mountain as an individual, if you are basing your relationship with God on trying to get back to that mission trip, back to that retreat, back to that experience, back to the time when you will miss what God is doing now and what God is calling you to. And as a congregation, if we spend our time trying to get back to the good old days, which are never as good as we thought they were, we're going to miss where God's calling us now. Doug's sermon a few weeks ago was, ex was poignant and beautiful on lamenting, giving us a chance to lament COVID, to, to, to say, we don't like this. It gave us a chance for some of you to lament the hurts you've experienced as individuals within this congregation. And that was such a good and cathartic thing for so many people. But the point of a message like that isn't to live in those things. It's to name them, it's to process them, and it's to move forward. So church, as long as we look back and we say, oh, but if we could only get these people back, oh, if only so-and-so was still the pastor. Oh, if we only had these ministries, we are going to miss what God is calling us to next. Because, because it's not about the places or the practices. It's about the people. People are more important than places or practices. The final point. And here's how that relates. We can't always look back because God has got people for us to reach. God has got something for us to do in God's kingdom. And when you're looking backwards, you're missing the people. Friends, as a congregation, we don't need to go back to that mountaintop. As individuals, we don't need to long for the time when we need to look forward into where God is calling us. And yes, God may be calling you down through the valley. It is not fun in the valley. I remember a few years ago, I took a group of students to a mission trip in Kentucky. We went and hiked in the Cumberland Gap. And we went down this trail and it was supposed to be down and back up 1.8 miles. Well, we took a wrong turn and we ended up hiking 5.6 miles. Now, if you've ever hiked, 5.6 miles is a lot longer than 1.8 miles. It's no fun down in the valley sometimes. And going down is one thing. Coming back up is a different story. But Jesus calls us down into the valley because that's where the sheep are. But here's one other reason he calls us down through the valley. Because it's only down through the valley where you will begin the ascent to the next mountaintop. God is calling you to a different mountain, not to go back, but to go forward. And again, there will always be an excuse. There will always be a reason why, as an individual or as a congregation, we feel like we can't go up the next mountain. There will always be reasons, and most of them are actually very valid. But let me tell you a brief story. I want to tell you about Eric Wayenmeyer, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. This guy, on May 25th, 2001, became the first blind person to reach the summit of Mount Everest. 
You heard that right. Blind man reached the summit of Mount Everest. In 2008, he climbed Karsten's Pyramid on the island of Papua New Guinea, completing the seven summits, the highest point on every continent. This accomplishment closed the circuit on a 13-year journey that he began in 1995 with his ascent of Denali. He's joined by a select company of only 150 mountaineers to have accomplished the feat. He's not a, in a group of 150 fellow blind mountaineers. Only 150 people, period, when this was written, had accomplished this. And he's blind. If anyone had a reason not to climb a mountain, it was this guy. When you hear the voice of God calling you down through the valley and up a mountain, what excuses do you have? What excuses do I have? What excuses do we make as a congregation? We say, oh, but COVID. Oh, but this. Oh, but that. Friends, God has not called us to give reasons why we can't serve. Moses tried that, and God said, I'm not having it. I've called you. God is not through with you, and God is not through with us. God is calling you somewhere great. God is calling this church somewhere great. But it's up to us whether or not we follow. God will give you everything you need. Don't try to live back on the previous mountain. Follow Christ down into the valley and begin the difficult ascent to the next mountaintop. Because I promise you, on the next mountaintop, you'll have the sheep that you picked up in the valley and the view will be even better than the previous one. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for the mountaintops that we have, but Lord, we thank you for the valleys as well because that's where life happens. That's where ministry really takes place. Lord, we ask for the courage to follow you. We ask for the wisdom to hear your voice. And then we ask to be like Peter, who steps out of the boat. We ask to be like your disciples who followed you and left everything to do so. Lord, show us where you're taking us. And even if we don't see, just show us you. Show us your face, and that'll be enough for us to follow. Amen.